Right, we're on to the ba Battle of Bucket Putus. And uh, for those of you who haven't been following this, well, you should be following this. Go right back to the beginning. Go to page uh, one of the blog and start reading it through. And of course, follow these videos. And click on every single one of them because, you know, I need the numbers. Right. Um, yes, you can find it all at uh, lawrencegray.net slash travel with a capital T. And you'll find it all there under the uh, footsteps of following in the footsteps of Isabella Bird. All right. Uh, the Battle of Bucket Putus. Uh, well, there were a couple of battles there, really. And there was a lot of argy-bargy around that area uh, on a number of occasions. In fact, uh, the place is uh, nowadays notorious for its um, uh, dodgy bends and um, ghosts. Yes, people are strangely seeing ghosts giving lifts to... Uh, unsuspecting passers-by and what have you. It's, um, yeah, it, it, it hits the pet newspapers now and again around these ear parts. Anyway, and this is one of the reasons why there are so many ghosts, because um, there was a, quite a few fierce uh, fights around this area. But uh, back in, uh, I do believe, 1874, and, uh, uh, a guy called um, Mr. Velge, who we have mentioned before in Malacca, had, uh, had some of his uh, people sent up to Booker Potus to examine the uh, mining opportunities there. And in fact, one of these guys was a, a guy called Dominic Daly, a mining surveyor. Uh, we'll come across him in the next uh, blog. He's got an interesting little bit of history about him. Anyway, uh, this lot were being escorted by none other than our Captain Murray. And uh, Captain Murray and his uh, men or is that Captain Murray and his merry man? Captain Murray and his merry man. Never mind. Anyway, they're up there on Bugaputas and just happened to bump into 4,000 Malays determined to uh, rid the entire country of all white men. Uh, I do believe they actually said something like, we're going to turn them all into curry. Uh, I think I don't quote me on that. That is perhaps a quotation for another incident. But they had the same sentiments and... Uh, they were being sent up there by uh, the Yam Chun of Negri Semplan, who was particularly angry with um, Datu Klana for doing these deals. And he wanted to get rid of all these uh, mining surveyors up there and make sure that they were going to be his mining surveyors, um, I assume. Uh, but uh, he was marching on, uh, uh, on Saramban to get rid of the British, so they say. And... Unfortunately, our Captain Murray walked straight into them and there was, uh, after being told to withdraw, Captain Murray said, no, no, we are here on official business and uh, the Malays, uh, you should re uh, you should withdraw because we are um, actually, well, we're coming to get you. Uh, at this point, um, all hell let loose and poor old Captain Murray lost, <clears throat> lost 30 men. Now then, that was a little bit of a shock to the system. Uh, and they ran for it, uh, him and uh, as many men as he could gather, and they, they ran back to Saramban, and uh, he barricaded himself into the British residency there and sent off uh, help from, well, anywhere he could find. Uh, the people in the barracks uh, had also uh, barricaded themselves in, and uh, it all looked rather touch and go at that point, and the Malays advanced rather rapidly into town, and then... Uh, did what they often did. They stopped off for lunch, probably. Uh, they stopped and they made another fortification in a little village called Paroy. I believe that's the right pronunciation. Uh, and um, Captain Murray, being a proactive sort of chap, uh, decided, oh, right, well, they, they've stopped. It's, they're, they're obviously regrouping and uh, are otherwise distracted. Let's attack them, counterattack. So they went in for a counterattack, and uh, it, it failed miserably. It was uh, uh, a real standoff, and they got stuck uh, um, hurling well, more than abuse at each other. But uh, anyway, Captain Murray um, never quite recovered from the rather twitchy moment there, and uh, he could see that uh, he would certainly have to wait for reinforcements and cannons and other such things. I mean, they, they were improvising all the time and banging away with uh, bringing up artillery and losing it and 
it, it was it was a pretty touch and go. Um, the Malays weren't making much headway, uh, so what was going on with, with them, I do not know. Uh, but one suspects they were doing what often these uh, uh, rather um, ad hoc groups do. They were breaking up into small groups and, and saying, we should be going this direction, no, this direction, we should be attacking such and such. You know, there, there was a sort of lack of forethought and planning. Uh, they didn't really plan for success. Either way, eventually, uh, Malacca responded and uh, was, well, they had their own troubles at the time. Uh, you know, there was riots and fighting on the streets in Malacca at the time. But th they sent off uh, 60 men to uh, try and help old Captain Murray. These took their time. Uh, Captain Murray's nerves uh, obviously got somewhat frayed. And um, by the time they arrived, though, um, uh, the, uh, the Malays seem to have withdrawn somehow back to their fortifications up in the uh, Bukit Putas um, where they were probably planning on uh, well really they essentially they just wanted to hold on to uh, that land because they knew that that's what um, uh, Dato Klana had uh, uh, flogged off to the uh, to Mr. Velge and his, his team so uh, you know I suspect money could have exchanged hands uh, and solved all the problem at this point, but no. Nope. Uh, what happened is that uh, the, this new invigorated force went up there to confront them and um, well, got stuck again under fire and uh, it was all a bit of a mess until plucky Captain Channer uh, noticed that uh, there were some cooking smells around one of the uh, uh, redoubts, I guess, stockades, let's put it that way, that uh, uh, the Malays had set up uh, and he and a couple of his uh, his uh, Gurkhas went and took a look and noticed that, well, all the people in that stockade were sitting around eating. And if you've lived in Malaya for any length of time, you will know that this is sacred time for for Malays. They just do love that food. They can't get enough of it. They're very proud of it. Do not ever insult Malaysia's food. That's a, that's a good travel hack for you. If you want to make friends here, say how wonderful that deep fried chewy liver is and well, laksa and other stuff. Never mind. I'm getting distracted because it's lunchtime now. But old Captain Channer and uh, he, he, he and uh, these couple of Gurkhas suddenly say, Why, let's, let's just climb in there and give them the fright of their lives. And they climbed into the, uh, uh, into, into the, the stockade and they shot a couple of them and sent them running crazy. They thought, well, they thought they'd been invaded. And in fact, it was only Captain Channer and a couple of his mates. Uh, and uh, at that point, Captain Channer whistles up for his, the rest of his team and they rush and they take control of the stockade. All the, the Malays run off to uh, spread alarm, saying oh, the, the, the British have come in from, from behind us. They're, they're surrounding us there um, because they were very uncertain as to what the hell was going on. And then the, the, uh, the Gurkhas opened fire on the other stockades from their, their stockade and this caused complete chaos and uh, everybody ran for cover and the British advanced and chased them all the way to Surrey Mentry where the Yam Chuan, uh, seeing the British were coming, um, packed up all his uh, servants and slaves and, and they all ran off to uh, Johor rather rapidly. And uh, in Johor they met up with Abu Bakr. Abu Bakr was, um, uh, at that point it was called, it was the Temangong. I think the British were calling him the Raja because uh, they never quite worked out what Temangongs meant or the difference between a Raja and a Sopt. They, they, they were always confused about these things. Um, and he, he, he'd been, uh, um, well, he visited Queen Victoria and got on very well with her. And, uh, and he, he was a, a man that had been doing business with the British. He, he knew how to deal with the British. And in fact, he knew people in the foreign office back in Britain. And he knew they were really unhappy about the local British intervention in the uh, uh, what they were calling the native states. They were they thought it was treachery. 
In fact, it was undermining the British uh, policy of, of not interfering in the, uh, uh, the affairs of, of, uh, of, of uh, foreign states and what have you. you know. uh, it all sounds quite familiar, this, this story, but uh, they, they, anyway, the, the, the British didn't want to uh, get involved in it. And, they, and, they, and, and Abu Bakr said, well, I tell you what, why don't you reinstall the Amtrum and give him a pension and some money to develop his state. He will accept your interests in Sunai Ujong and uh, you give him the money to develop his own mining corporations and, and what have you. And, and uh, everybody would be happy. It, it would be just like my relationship with you. And uh, of course, the foreign office and the colonial office, uh, they were happy about that, quite happy about that, and, and, and sent him back into, well, Sedimentary, where he lived for the next 11 years. He didn't spend any of that money on development, but he, he bought a whole load of new slave girls, which, uh, as you can well, he lived for, to a ripe old age, a, a very happy man. Unfortunately for Captain Murray, he was stuck back in Sungai Ujong, uh, unable to get the military force that was required to keep him in safety as he thought and he had to deal with uh, uh, the arch enemy of course of uh, Datu Banda who had supported the young Chuan and in his endeavours to get rid of the British and so on uh, so he was left very isolated and rather twitchy and when Isabella Bird met him he was pretty much of a wreck and so um, they had uh, their final farewell uh, and in the farewell dinner, they sang Old Lang Syne, and old Captain Murray, he wept. And in fact, um, the next day when they were waving goodbye on the jetty, Captain Murray wept yet again. And she paints a rather pathetic picture of the, the man turning away, striding off with his bulldog by his side, and uh, just walking off into the distance. A self-exiled man, she calls him. Now... Of course, I'm not really certain as to what that actually means. Self-excised? I, I guess he could have resigned. Perhaps that's what she asked him to do. Why don't you resign? Bugger off, you know, you take the pension. He was only 38, you know. Uh, so I guess he thought, uh, this is my career. I've got to stick this out. Otherwise, I'll never get anywhere. So he, he was pretty pissed off about everything and died the year after, ostensibly of heat stroke. He got a pretty decent eulogy, saying what a wonderful man he was. Uh, the official eulogy says he was a man of great tact and charm. Uh, Isabella thought him well, rather blunt and tactless, if not a man with a certain charm, but he was in a very, very bad place. Anyway, she goes off and leaves. And in fact, she has to say farewell to Captain Haywood. Ah. And she has a little bit of a frisson of, I keep using that word frisson, I'm not sure whether, I, whether I'm using it correctly. Anyway, she has a, a little quavering moment and she leaves, leaves Sung Ai Ujong and goes off now to Selon Law, where she ends up in Klang. And, well, that's for the next blog. So, look, uh, share and... Uh, and, and uh, comment, and uh, like, and um, subscribe, and goodbye. Bye. <laughs>